I'm not sure if Paul Graham first said this, but it was like, it, it was a, a joke about what happens when, um, when you just blindly A-B test. So if you A-B test any website to the limit, like as in the limit as time goes infinity, you will end up with a porn site. So if you just keep A-B testing, keep A-B testing, keep A-B testing, what do people want to see? What do people want to see? And you end up with a porn site. That, that's basically the argument. Like you can get blinded by just like looking at the quantitative or likewise, you know, you can end up solving a niche problem that doesn't really scale or generalize if you're looking just at, at the qualitative. So that, that balance back and forth, I totally agree, is like so important. Hello everyone, Ken here, back with another incredible interview for you. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Jeremy Harris. Now, Jeremy is the co-founder of Sharpest Minds, which is a data science, machine learning, and analytics mentorship program that's free until you get a job. Sharpest Minds is a Y Combinator-backed startup, which is a pretty, pretty big deal in the startup community. They're also the world's largest mentorship marketplace for data science, with mentors from companies like Google, Tesla, Airbnb, and Shopify. Jeremy himself is also the host of the official Towards Data Science podcast, where he talks to world-class data scientists and machine learning researchers about everything from data science careers to the future of humanity. I was actually on his podcast a few weeks ago, so definitely check that out after you watch this video. It's linked below. Jeremy has an incredibly unique perspective on the data science job market from his work at Sharpest Minds. In this interview, we discuss some of the metrics associated with the data science interview process, some of the parallels between entrepreneurship and data science, and we take a deep dive into his incredible journey. Now onto the interview. So thank you for agreeing to chat with me, Jeremy. I think that you have some incredible experience and awesome background, especially in the startup space that I haven't had exposure to with any of the guests that I've brought in so far. So I think a lot of the people who tune into this will get a tremendous value, one, about what entrepreneurship and data science is like, two, about what the job market and data science is like, because your company is, Sharpest Minds is focused on that. And yep. three, just, you have a really interesting perspective on life. We've had quite a few conversations so far. So I'm sure some of that will bleed into our conversation here. So the first thing I would like from you is just a little bit more of an introduction beyond what I've, I've previously mentioned. And also, I usually like to start with people talking about how they first got interested in the data science domain. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, great. Happy to do it. And I'm really thrilled to do this, by the way. I've um, So at Sharpest Minds, we've been fans of your channel and kind of in it. We noticed it, I think, a couple of months ago, and then we've been watching a lot of videos ever since recommending them to people. So I think it's just great content. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of my own background. So I started off, I was a physicist uh, back in the day in undergrad. I did physics uh, in my master's and then I did two and a half years of physics PhD and then I dropped out. And I dropped out to go into startups with my brother. We basically built this like deep learning startup to recommend restaurants to people, which is like, I mean, don't do it. Uh, it's a terrible idea, but it, it's in a funny way. I mean, it, it taught us a lot about well, the technology and also what it means to, to build companies and what it means to build companies around solutions rather than building companies around problems. And it turns out you wanted to actually build companies around problems, not companies around solutions. So that was a big lesson for us there. And um, anyway, through, through the course of that, we encountered a whole bunch of other startups and uh, one big through line that we discovered at the time, it was 2016, people were having a really hard time recruiting data scientists. And so it occurred to us that we probably could get involved in that ecosystem just because we knew so many people, um, friends who were in grad school, for example, physicists, mathematicians, that sort of thing. And that became our focus for a couple of years until we went through Y Combinator in uh, winter uh, 2018. And finally, we ended up with this, um, this income share agreement marketplace, which is what Sharpest Minds has become through the course of all this kind of recruitment work. Basically, what we were originally doing was matching candidates with companies. So we're basically like a recruiter. One of the things we learned about ourselves in that process was we don't like being recruiters. Recruiters only make money when their candidate gets matched up with their company. And so you have this like weird incentive where you're playing this numbers game and you just kind of want to mash together as many candidates and companies as you can. And that didn't really jive with the way we were philosophically inclined. We wanted to invest in our users. We wanted to be able to 
help people with their resumes, want to be able to give people advice. That's what we were doing anyway. We just weren't getting paid for it. And so it occurred to us to say, you know what? We really should align our incentives explicitly. We should have a business model that reflects our own personal preferences. And that makes the business a lot more enjoyable too. And so that's how Sharpest Minds was born. Uh, we ended up actually still are the world's only marketplace where mentors and mentees come together and basically mentors invest in their mentees future success. So if you're trying to break into data science, you're like a junior level data scientist, or you're trying to get your first job, you work with a senior developer mentor who helps you through code review, interview prep, all that kind of thing in exchange for a small percentage of your first year's salary when you're hired. So it's all free up front. It's basically an investment that they're making in you. So mentors are kind of like investors through this. So I guess there's a bit of a double meaning then in terms of like uh, the kind of startup data science experience we've had on the one hand to us, mentors are kind of like mini startups. Like we've been studying how they, how they invest in different opportunities, different mentees, how they coach them through stuff and help them overcome obstacles. And then we've also had this like meta experience of just building a startup that enables that a platform that enables that. So uh, it's been a real adventure and um, I've, I've loved every second of it, but uh, that's, that's where we're at now. Yeah. That's so awesome. Honestly, there's so much to unpack from just that brief background you had. I probably, I really want to ask a lot of questions specifically about the company. So, but the first thing I wanted to talk about is your background in physics. I get a lot of questions when I say, I think physics is a really good path into data science. And I, I really do, because to me, it is applied math and applied math is very similar to data science. Can you expand just a little bit more on the parallels between those skill sets? And then I'm going to just pepper you with questions about entrepreneurship, Trapper's Minds, AI, et cetera. I know, absolutely happy to do it. I think there are so many different parallels. Um, almost everything maps onto data science in some way. I think the, um, so, so physicists have a particular angle of approach to data science that I agree, I think is pretty, it's pretty straightforward. There, you can draw a straight line from physics to data science in ways that maybe you can't quite on, you know, like a history degree or something else. Um, one of the key things that distinguishes physics from, uh, say, theoretical math, for example, is this concept of contact with the unforgiving. So you're going to come up with some physical theory, you're going to write down a bunch of beautiful equations, and you really, really hope that they work out. But someday, someone's going to go into a lab and actually test your theory. And nature doesn't care how pretty your equations were or how elegant your math was, it's going to give you an answer. And that answer may or may not accord with what you hope the universe will show you. Now, unfortunately, that's what happens in physics, and um, that's a big part of what had me leave my, my grad studies. It becomes really frustrating because those experiments are very relentless, and, um, and the real world is a lot the same way when you're a data scientist. So you'll have a hypothesis, and uh, you'll go out and test it, and the, the world is going to return an answer. I think one of the key ways in which these uh, two areas are really similar as well is overfitting. So one of the biggest dangers in in physics, in data science, and life in general, is to overfit your model of the world. And what I mean by that is, in physics, we have um, this, this really frustrating problem where people feel like they pretty much know how everything works already. No one is going into a physics lab today and thinking that they're going to discover something that will overturn the Schrodinger equation. Like, in fact, it's the point where I was doing experiments, and when I would get a result that did not accord with the predictions of my theory, I knew the result was wrong. I would just say, oh, I didn't align my setup properly. Let me go through again and re like redo my setup. And now I'll get the result that accords with all the laws of quantum mechanics that we know. That was my area where I was, I was working. Now, if you're familiar with data science, when you hear that, there should be overfitting alarm bells going off in your mind. Because what I'm really doing is I've got my, my trading data set and I'm going back and saying, oh, oh shit, I'm not getting the right result. Let me just go back, tweak my hyperparameters and try again. And so you end up with this pathological cycle where you've got physicists running around redoing their experiments every time they don't give a result that's consistent with established orthodox theory. So that's one, one sense in which you've really got to watch, that, watch out for that. In data science, sort of the same thing at a meta level. You've got hypotheses about your data. Sometimes our egos or pressures from our companies force us to try to prove out theories that may not actually be true. So you always have to kind of check in with yourself to see you know, am I, am I looking for data that's going to, you know, basically just doing confirmation bias here? Am I just looking for data that's going to validate what I already believe? Or am I genuinely open to all the possibilities? And so I think there, there's a lot of overlap philosophically, um, almost metaphysically between the two, the two fields. Uh, I think physics is, is really helpful for that. I think it comes with its own baggage. 
and the baggage that physics comes with is uh, what at Sharpest Minds we, we uh, lovingly refer to as cocky physicist syndrome. So a physicist is a person who is told through the course of their undergrad, their master's, their PhD, whatever, you're constantly told over and over again that you are right because the equations of physics that people have worked out for hundreds of years are very rarely disproven. And so you get used to modeling the world better than all the, the uh, muggles around you who don't know all these beautiful equations. And so you develop this complex where you think like, I, I have this like mastery of these beautiful equations. No one can understand the vast power that I hold in my mind and so on. And, um, and so that's actually a risk. Like that's a real danger. We brought that with us in startups. So when we started our first company, the reason that we went solution first was ego and cockiness. We felt that we could literally derive algorithms from scratch, uh, create solutions for problems. We didn't even bother to check whether they existed. This was really the, the whole arc of that, that early period was driven by cocky physicist syndrome. And that's something that I think we all have a bit of that. I think physicists might struggle more than most with it just because of the epistemology of the space. But uh, I guess that's, uh, that's how I see them tying in. Well, I think it's something that, that that's something that is not unique to physicists, uh, physics. I think right. that very much so in the data science space as well, you, you get quite a lot of that, is that my algorithms cannot be wrong. I am smarter than you business person because yeah. I have the math to back me up. And you drew some very interesting parallels. I think physics is like a very specific type of data science where you're looking mm -hmm. at a lot of very similar problems or you're looking at a very confined feature space that have very, very difficult or well-known answers. If we extrapolate that out, the broader field of data science is very similar to that. We just have a lot more problems and a lot more low hanging fruit. So I, I think it's a very natural step for physicists to go into data science because they're like, oh, there's so many problems out here that have quote unquote easy answers compared to what yeah. I've been solving. I also love your conversation about your, uh, your ego or your overconfidence entering the entrepreneurship space. I think that to me, that's obviously something that, that I've experienced. It's kind of the opposite of what a lot of people face with data science. They have imposter syndrome, which is generally the, the opposite <laughs> side of that coin. But I love that, that you have the humility to learn from your mistakes and no matter what situation you're in, if you're overconfident, if you don't feel confident enough, the most practical thing, the solution to both of those problems is to look objectively at what you're doing and, and understand where you can improve and, and the mistakes that you're making. So I love that story. One thing you said way earlier that I really want to call out and get more of your thoughts on is you said that this is what Sharpest Minds became. So the idea that you started with was clearly not where you're at today and it probably isn't the, the end of the journey as well. Can you talk more on, you know, for example, how a entrepreneurial venture changes over the course of from when it starts to when it, for example, gets YC backed or when it starts making money and how that relates to the data science journey as well uh, with a data science project, for example. Definitely. Actually, um, maybe I'll start with a data science metaphor. And I don't even think this is a metaphor, actually. I think this is just rigorously true that uh, a startup is a, um, it's a kind of reinforcement learning agent and it's doing gradient descent on its model of the world all the time to try to find the areas where there is demand. And then it's trying to keep climbing that hill. And those hills, by the way, are really hard to find. First thing, if we're gonna define um, the mathematics of the startup landscape, and I actually think that's a good place to start because that is the landscape you find yourself in. When you start a startup, you're airdropped into this landscape. And if you've never done startups before, you have no idea what the, what the geometry of this landscape is, but it is quite unique. There are a lot of common kind of generalizable properties that it has that you're much better off knowing when you get started. So the first property is that peaks in what I'll call product space are very, very, very narrow. Okay, so peaks in product space are very narrow. So you imagine the space of, of all the possible products in the world, and it's super high dimensional. I mean, there's like, Think about all the different properties a, a product could have. It's got a number of wheels. It's got a color. It's got a weight. It's got a price. Like all these properties. I mean, it's probably infinite dimensional space, but let's just imagine it's like landscape or something like that. 
that landscape is flat at zero for the vast majority of, of possible products. The vast majority of possible products are not interesting to anyone. Nobody wants to buy them. A product with one wheel and uh, a dead battery painted blue and a raspberry pie on top isn't interesting. Nobody is going to buy this. Um, so when you think about like how specific the products around us have to be in order to actually scratch our itch, that specificity is incredibly high. So you've got this very flat landscape and occasionally you've got these really gigantic, very jagged, very sharp peaks. Now the problem is you might think to yourself, oh, I can, I can start the search really close to a peak. Why? Because I have a great idea. Usually, and this is where the whole cocky physicist syndrome mentality comes in, usually your great idea is total garbage. And I know this. I'm a professional at coming up with terrible ideas and desperately trying to implement them. I did this for years and years and years. And it's like, it's really challenging because everybody is so different that coming up with something that generalizes to enough people that they'll pay for what you're doing is so hard. You get emotionally invested in what you're building. And so you start to create this imaginary landscape uh, like a, a map of an imaginary startup landscape, but the map isn't the territory. They just, they're not equivalent. The, the real startup landscape is much less forgiving. And so that's what, as much as you can, the ego is what makes the difference between the map and the territory here. And you want to transcend, you want to get to the territory. You want to kind of appreciate where you are and be very honest with yourself and start to talk to people as soon as possible. So your first job is to figure out, okay, What's the area, the, the subspace of that, that uh, territory that I want to start in? And usually building something for yourself is the right way to go. We started off, for example, that restaurant app. We did a terrible job because like, we don't know anything about restaurants, but we had cocky physicist syndrome. So we thought we could just kind of concoct it out of nowhere. So instead, over time, what we, the way our solution developed or our product or our startup was to make something that was closer and closer to what we wish we'd had when we started. And I know that's how, I mean, that's how your YouTube channel um, has grown and evolved, right? I mean, all great products start like this, or many of them do. Uh, it's very, very rare. In fact, it's so rare that when it happens, when somebody actually thinks of a, a good product idea without having any experience in the space, it's like, a, it becomes legendary. Reddit is a story like this. So the founders of Reddit, it was You'd their first guy. time at Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It was like their, their first time around and, and at a YC dinner uh, that they were at, they were like, yeah, honestly, like everything just kind of worked. And it was the only time we'd ever heard this. Everybody else will give you this horror story, of just like slogging through it, schlepping all that. It just worked for them. And then their second startup was a disaster. And that's because they hadn't learned the lessons from that first kind of slog. So you're actually not gaining anything by being handed something from on high. If you happen to like just randomly land on a peak in product space, you're not going to learn how to find them. You're not going to have a generalizable skill set. Your algorithm, your, your optimization algorithm doesn't get stress tested. Instead, you just got lucky and your, your weights were activated randomly and initialized randomly into perfect, like for whatever reason, you know, perfect configuration. That's incredibly rare. And it's easy to understand in the context of a neural network, but people fail to apply that same logic when they start thinking about startup space, but it's the same problem. So you start up, you, you're, you've got this flat um, space. And what flatness means is there's no gradient. You don't know which way to go. Uh, if you talk to one of your users, for example, the few people who will actually like, give you the time of day, they'll give you all kinds of weird, contradictory advice about where they want your product to go. They'll tell you, oh, well, you should turn this into a dating app for college freshmen, or, oh, you should uh, turn this into like a dating app for like older people. Or, like, and, and you'll get all these conflicting stories and there, there's enough feedback that you think that people want what you're doing, but they want something that they imagine you're building and that, that, that you're just never gonna be able to satisfy all those needs. And that's what that flatness does. It gives you a gradient that's very ambiguous. And it's only once you start talking to people about their problems, not their, the solutions that they want, but their actual problems, that you start mapping out that territory. And as you map it more and more, eventually you start to be able to notice, oh, I think there's a hill. And you kind of find yourself closer to the hill. And once you get there, the way you know you're onto something is people's feedback starts to get really specific. So they won't be telling you like, oh, it would be great if you could just like add a, I don't know, a giant feature that like, you know, is a different product. They'll tell you like, oh, could you move this button here? Could you do this or that? They're getting more invested in the product. They're volunteering the advice themselves. Eventually, um, it, it really starts to give you an unambiguous direction. And that's just like a machine learning model that's latched onto a gradient, follow that, and ultimately um, growth follows. So I guess that, that's the, the mapping. I think the main lesson here is the schlepping that involves talking to users. That's, without that, you have no gradient.
I love your focus on the problem here. That's something that you're, you're hundred percent right. It, it cuts through so much of the ambiguity <clears throat> when we're thinking about starting a data science project or starting to learn data science. So many people don't know where to start mm -hmm. and they're like, what should I learn? All of the skills that are out there, Python, all the statistics, all the different packages, all of these things or are whatever language you want to use. There, there's such a large feature space and yeah. at the start, that's all very flat. If you start with a problem and you say, Hey, this is an area where I want to solve the number of things that you need to solve that problem becomes very finite. I know I need some programming. I know for this problem, I probably need linear regression or something very basic. And it's a lot clearer about what you need to do or what's actionable for the solution that you're trying to, to come to. So I love that there's a very clear parallel there. I also think that there's so many parallels with entrepreneurship and data science as well. That's one of the things that really drew me to the field is I've always kind of seen myself like an entrepreneur. I don't, I've never, never said it was a successful entrepreneur, but, <laughs> um, but to me that, uh, the whole idea of creating a project and having a hypothesis where you're coming in, oh, I have this great idea, but being open to the fact that your idea could be wrong and needs to move is something yeah. that I think is so important. I, you, you can't over-engineer solutions. You have to go in and say, oh, the data is telling me something different. The data is yeah. telling me that, that the solutions may be more over here than over here, and I should drive my analysis towards that. I mean, I've, I've gone into so many problems where I thought a solution was going to turn out one way and it's way more interesting how it actually turns out. Yeah. And, and I, I do think one, one big part, it's interesting as, as you mentioned that, I think one of the biggest points of overlap there for data scientists, like the best data scientists get their hands dirty. I think we, as humans, we love to think that there's a, there's going to be a moment in life where we're going to reach an ivory tower. We won't have to worry about the plebs. We're not going to have to go out and schlep and talk to a bunch of people. Um, but if you like, if you're a data scientist investigating a problem, very often the answer, like part of the answer is going to involve reaching out to the users and asking them, Hey, like, how's your experience around this feature been? Like, if you notice a lot of people are like, if you're Netflix and people are, are leaving for Disney plus, like you probably want to talk to users. You don't just want to look at this like data layer and, and just focus on that as if your users are these abstractions that you don't have to worry about. There's a, a kind of qualitative richness and depth that comes from actually going through that schlep. And that's exactly what like Y Combinator drilled into us from day one. It's like, talk to your users. The number of times that, you know, we go to a YC partner, we'd be like, hey, we're really like, we're struggling here. The, their answer 70% of the time was just some, some variation on go out there, find the people who are leaving your product and talk to them, ask them the question. Well, I think that there's such an interesting combination of perspectives there so there's to, to me there's there's unbelievable value in communicating with your users i respond to almost every youtube comment still because that to me is how i get that's amazing the best feedback because there's so much bias in when you ask questions as well so there's an art to you know if you're thinking about like an art yeah. to putting together surveys or whatever that might be the other thing though is that users often have unarticulated needs or they'll have problems with the feature, but won't be able to explicitly tell you what the problem is. You know, maybe the button, you know, they're not clicking it on, on that side of the screen, but they don't know they would click it more if they put it on the left side of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So th the idea of actually analyzing this data and figuring out what the users won't tell you is also a really, really incredibly valued component. So if you can yes. tie the qualitative, to the observations that they have, because the observations are the ground truth in the feature space that you have. Yeah. But you can't know anything outside of that feature space. There's huge value in the qualitative side. Um, and again, a parallel to data science is when you're working on any business project, the subject area expertise is unbelievably valuable. Yes. You know, if, if I'm working with a golf client and they keep hitting it on the left side of a certain fairway, when we're telling them, the, the probability that your scoring is going to go way, way down in a positive way uh, if you hit it on the right side. And they're like, Ken, there's this overhanging branch yes. and I literally cannot hit it on that side of the fairway. I'm like, oh, oh you know, like that, that is meaningful to me, right? Um, 
So I, I just really want to point that out is that, you know, there's two sides to this. And yeah, as, as a data scientist, as an entrepreneur, it's so important to, to think it, about both of these. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's very deeply true. Like, um, I certainly wouldn't want to convey the impression it's all about talking, like just about talking to users. I think what happens is those qu quantitative and qualitative elements, they each carry the risk, if you focus exclusively on one, of landing you in a local optimum. And the only way to break out of that is at times you've got to go, okay, frame shift, let's start talking to people. And then, okay, frame shift, let's start um, looking at the data. There's this, uh, to wit, there's this really, uh, I find it funny, um, I think, I'm not sure if Paul Graham first said this, but it was like, it, it was a, a joke about what happens when, um, when you just blindly A-B test. So if you A-B test any website to the limit, like as in the limit as time goes infinity, you will end up with a porn site. So if you just keep A-B testing, keep A-B testing, keep A-B testing, what do people want to see? What do people want to see? And you end up with a porn site. That, that's basically the argument. Like you can get blinded by just like looking at the quantitative or likewise, you know, you can end up solving a niche problem that doesn't really scale or generalize if you're looking just at, at the qualitative. So that, that balance back and forth, I totally agree, is like so important. Awesome. Well, so there's something that I find very interesting about your story. I doubt you've been asked about this before, but you see quite a few successful entrepreneurs who are, are who have siblings. I think the most oh, yeah. prominent example is Elon Musk, where yeah. him and his brother have Handle. gone into business, quite a few successful businesses together. I look at you guys in the exact same light. So I'm expecting oh, course, big things. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna take on some of the other planets when, when Mars is colonized, I'm sure. Yeah, that's right. But Occupy Venus. I would I would love to hear more about how going into business with, with your brother or going into business with someone who you view as uh, having a partner in business or having a partner in any of these things can create value. And if that bled into the idea of sharpest minds at all because of the mentorship. I think that, you know, regardless of if you have a mentorship uh, relationship with your brother or not, I mean, th that can always be a little bit weird, but um, the idea that you have someone to work with mm -hmm. or someone to improve your skills with is, is fascinating to me. And the idea that you can also push each other to towards success, like I believe you have, uh, is also an incredibly interesting concept to me as an only child. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. No, th I think that's a great question. I think as well, I, I should be wary of the fact that my, my answer probably won't generalize all that well. So I've always had a close relationship with my brother. I know not everyone has a close relationship with their, their um, siblings. And often that can be as well, just because of an age difference. We had a, a two to three year age difference, almost three years. And, um, and for that reason, you know, it's not, not so far that you're completely out of touch with each other. I think um, we've always, I, I think it's fair to say we've been neuro atypical our whole lives. And um, so sort of encountered, encountered barriers in the world that were maybe not analogous to each other, but uh, th that at least gave us an appreciation for what the other person was going through. So you, you kind of recognize like, okay, you know, uh, I'll struggle in this kind of social situation. And because I, I just don't get this aspect of people and like, that's just a, a place where my brain breaks. And then his would likewise and sort of you know, a bit of a source of bonding there. Um, I think though, one of the key things, if you do have a close relationship with a sibling, going into business together, um, one of, the only reason that a startup will fail is if you give up on it. It's very hard to give up on your sibling. And so in a way, like, so we, we, can, we can absolutely like go at it. And in the early days, in 2015, 2016, when we started, uh, we would go at it. Like, like we would, like, it, it, you know, there were times where it wasn't pretty and it wasn't professional. And that's just kind of part of the growth experience. You sort of like learn what part of it is your ego. And, and it makes the ego parts much more intense too. Cause like any uh, sibling dynamic, right? There's like, there's a, a sub, a, there, it wasn't too bad for us, but there's a, a subtext of competition. There's, um, there's a lot of like your, your uh, deepest fears are, are to some degree and hopes wrapped up in this individual because you, you were raised with them. So everything feels that much more existential all the time. But if you can get through that, you're left with a relationship that you absolutely can't sacrifice. I mean, you, you oh. can't, yeah, I can't walk out on my brother. That just, that's not going to happen. Well, and, that to me is really a very interesting concept of this related to how you, you know, you, if you keep working, it, it's really, really difficult to fail. Um, yeah. But 
I, I've had quite a few business partners in the past. And, you know, I, a lot of the time, I, you can't really, it's really difficult, especially personally for me to criticize someone or to say, hey, we need to get this in gear or hey, to do those things. Yeah. And frankly, you can do that to your family member. They're still going to be your family at the end of the day. Um, in most cases, a lot of business partners, <laughs> they're like, look, I'm going to walk away from this. Um, or like, I'm losing interest in this or whatever that might be. And I think that that additional layer of connectedness can really aid in that longevity because you know, you still have this bedrock of family to lay on. Um, yes. Yeah. But, I, I do think, I mean, I count myself as, as maybe the, the luckiest entrepreneur in the world because of the people we ended up encountering as we went through this process. We like, it started with me and my brother and we brought on very early on a guy called Russell, who is now our CTO. I mean, basically he's like a, he's like a, another co-founder. He's been with us through thick and thin through YC, through everything. Uh, he dropped out of his PhD actually to join us. We were just like, hey man, we have no idea what we're doing. You have no idea what you're doing. Let's have no idea what we're doing together. Um, so that was basically it. He, so what he brought to the dynamic was really interesting because there was this high level trust between me and Ed and it became really difficult to imagine bringing somebody on board who we couldn't be as honest with. It just like, it would have been weird because you'd have like this, this one relationship where all information was going back and forth seamlessly and then this other person where you're just not dealing with them the same way. And, um, and Russell was a really powerful influence in terms of getting us to deal with each other more professionally, in terms of getting us to understand outside opinion as well, because one of the pitfalls of two brothers is same Do model as the world, right? That's right. Like if, you, if you're thinking of it in terms of random forests, like your, uh, your estimators are highly correlated at that point, And that comes with a lot of error. So you're not benefiting from the ensemble averaging. Uh, Russell definitely brought in some of that fresh perspective. Um, he's done a ton of writing on, on, uh, thinking about process and startups. And actually, I, I think I always recommend this, but RussellPolari.com is his, is his website. He's got great essays on this stuff and it's, it's worth checking out from a habit building standpoint, from a startup standpoint. Uh, and then uh, a bit more recently, we brought on um, someone called Alejandro who sort of same thing. Like it's, it's weird the people you collect, the people who you end up clicking with and sticking around. If you grow slowly, um, you, can, you can really create this core of people who are incredibly high quality and Alejandro is like, I don't know how to describe him other than by saying he's like, he's like a walking, um, it's almost like therapist meets hustler. Like he, he, the guy, the guy like will, will, he's very problem solving focused, but, but he's, his conversations with you will always open with an incredibly like direct personal question. And that has a way of filtering out people who are in it for the fluff. So he'll, he'll just like, he'll lead with something about himself saying like, Hey, yeah, man, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm really, uh, I found myself kind of sad today or like whatever. And it takes you off guard. You're like, whoa, what's going on here? Very direct conversation. And it's a great filtering function. And it's a really great way of getting people to open up. So he has conversations with our users and they're very deep conversations. He engages them right away. He makes it clear that he's a human being and makes himself vulnerable. And, um, and he builds these high trust relationships with the user base. And that's translated into great feature ideas. And, um, and between him and Russell and Ed, I mean, I, the, the whole ecosystem around me, I've been so fortunate. I mean, if everything went to, to hell tomorrow, I would be so much better off for, I'm like, I'm really, uh, anyway, I'm thrilled about where I am. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is awesome. I, I think that especially through YouTube, through a lot of the content that I'm producing, the biggest benefit to me is that I've been able to meet incredible people. I've been able right. to have conversations like this about you know how success happens or how, how you uh, build a successful team or how um, you know how to, how to think about these problems and I absolutely love that uh, that's something you know all, all of the subscribers all of the people who I've interviewed it's really becoming a part of, of who I am and it's it's shaping my view of the world which is fascinating I never thought anything like this would yeah. be would be possible in general um, I have just a, a couple more questions, a couple about the data science job landscape, where I think you're yeah. very uniquely qualified to answer those, and also about content creation. Obviously, I've been on your podcast. I've, hopefully, that episode, I think, is coming out uh, in, you know, at some point here. Um, I think it's in the next couple of days, actually. It'll probably be out before this one. So. Oh, perfect. So I, I'll be able to reference it. I will link to it in the, in the video. But 
Um, so, so first I want to ask a couple questions about that landscape. And then next, I want to talk about your experience, content creation at, with content creation and how valuable it is to have a voice in this community. So when it comes to the, the job landscape, what was the most, what are some of the most surprising things to you that you found either through working uh, with mentees or through working with companies? Yeah, this, I think this is a great question. And, um, I think the things that are surprising are the, the disconnect between people's expectations of like of what they'll face when they go into the space and, and in the reality. So, so in some ways, what I find surprising and what our users find surprising are going to be coupled because, well, I mean, that, you know, that's, it's, it's surprising. We are our um, users. Yeah. We are our users. That's right. So I, I think the first thing is the, just the, the value of, of tenacity. Um, again, it's, you're like a startup of one. Uh, you're the only person in the world who has 100% equity in yourself. And the only way to actually fail is to stop. And what we've seen consistently is people who struggle um, to land jobs. And this is going to sound obvious, but they apply to fewer jobs. They try less. Um, some people, this is really tricky because there's like, it's psychologically more difficult for some people than for others. And this is why habit formation is such an important part of the equation. But at the end of the day, um, you, you want to actually try to calibrate your expectations before you decide to go into data science. It's a tough slog. Like it's difficult to get the attention of companies, especially in this environment, in this economy. And you want to go and like really map out for yourself, what will a day look like as I'm applying to these jobs? How much time am I really willing to spend on this process? So that's, that's like one aspect of it is just like how correlated the, the successes to the amount of the sheer amount of application work that we've seen. So some of the data we've seen about one to 2% on average of job board applications um, actually converted to interviews. So if you go through Indeed or monster.com and you apply to 50 to 100 applications, expect one interview. Like that, that data point really shocked us. I, actually, it's part of the reason why we now recommend against job boards. Um, we've been doing a lot of A-B testing. In line there. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> well, that, and, and like it's borne out in the numbers too. Like if you, um, job boards are, are really quick like you can apply very fast. Anytime you find that that's the case, you should be asking yourself questions about where is the market equilibrium here? If it's very, very easy to apply for a job, then everyone's applying for that job. There's no free lunch. Um, so your competition just grew. So if you want to increase your odds of receiving a response per application, you need to pick a more annoying route. You need to get in touch with people directly, send thoughtful messages, engage with people, um, and uh, you can do that over LinkedIn by DM, or you could do it through cold email. That's sort of where we focused our attention. So all our A-B tests have been oriented in that direction. And we see more than an order of magnitude improvement in terms of the response rates when you move from a job board to an Indeed or a, uh, sorry, to a LinkedIn or a um, cold email strategy. And that's and for, a lot of that is- oh, For sorry. the uninformed order of magnitude is usually by 10X, correct? 10X, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so what we see typically is anywhere from 10 to uh, 20. Actually, pre-COVID, we were seeing 20 to 30% response rates on um, using our, our cold email templates. We've been A-B testing those and optimizing them a lot, actually. But in general, I mean, any what we've learned is the optimization gets you a 50% um, 50 boost max. You're going to do way better, optimization or not, sending emails that are customized and personalized um, just because job boards are so saturated. And there's, there's no leverage there. It's a black hole, really. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think people also, I'm sure that warm emails or slightly warm emails do even better than the cold emails, right? Right. Totally. And people don't realize how big their network actually is. Mm -hmm. The thing for me is if you've gone to college, even everyone who also went to that college is no longer a cold email. Right. right. You have at least some area to connect on them with. And that can, that can be again, a, a couple percentage or even, even double your chance that you get a response in general. So to me, I, I love those numbers because that's what I've been, you know, virtually what I've been preaching for, for yeah. quite some time. <laughs> and that gives some quantitative backing to it. I, I didn't feel like I was uh, fraud in saying those things because I know them to be true from other industries. But oh, for sure. Yeah. It's incredible to have uh, that information there as well. Can you 
go into just a, a little bit of detail on what the optimizations are finding there. Is it, you know, um, is it important to, to, for example, like thank the person or, you know, you, you, what, what content for anyone watching when you're sending out an email can, can be helpful to them? Yeah. Great question. Actually, this is like uh, the, some of the biggest headaches we've had have been on this kind of question. So I guess a couple of quick thoughts. First off, the, uh, the uh, politenesses, the, the sort of greeting, hey, uh, dear so-and-so, thanks, bye, or best, or whatever, none of that really matters. Uh, it's all just noise in the system. The main thing you wanna think about is what is the first piece of content that you're gonna share with that person that's gonna register on the radar? And, and here, one of, I think, the, the biggest mistakes people will tend to make is to give the recipient homework so if I'm applying to work, Ken, with you, I'm like, hey, Ken, how's it going? Um, and the first thing that I send is like, hey, I just finished up this project. Uh, here's a, a link to a, a Jupyter notebook or a bunch of code on GitHub. Please check it out. Like you have a life, you have things you want to be doing other than this. Um, and, and everybody else does. Hiring managers do too. They're, they're people as well. So failing to recognize the, the humanity of the person you're sending this to, if it's not a message you would be excited to get, like you have no reason to expect another person to be excited about receiving that message. And so as a result, you do want to share content. There's no question, but you want to make that content digestible. So how do you make that content digestible? Well, you can be Ken G, you can make your own YouTube channel, it's wildly successful, or you can write blog posts. That's another angle, lots of nice visualizations and so on. But one of the best ways to do this is actually to build live apps. So uh, for example, if you want to make, I don't know, let's say like a predictor to, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it. It's, it, it's the first thought that came to mind. It's kind of grim, but like a life expectancy predictor, somebody enters their, their demographic information. It's like, Hey, you're going to die on the state, make it, turn it into a toy, make it into an app. And then that way you're, you're sending them a toy to play with their curiosity will be piqued. And rather than saying like, Hey, want to read 500 lines of code? You're saying, Hey, want to find out like when you're going to die or whatever it is. Um, so, so that's really number one. You can if you don't respond, if you don't respond to this email, it's going to tell you tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's right. The counter is going to go down. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, but you can always link to it to like your GitHub repo or whatever else from that live app as well. And if they're interested, they'll check it out. But it's about a seduction. It, you're, you're, you're going on a first date here. You're not like, don't ask them to marry you right away. Um, you know, you just introduce yourself and, and your catastrophic failures as a human being one at a time. You know, like I didn't tell my girlfriend that I was a terrible person when I first met her. She had to find that out. That was the cost of going to dinner with me. So it's and the that same makes thing. you more endearing now. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> at least, at least I have a sense of humor about my feelings. <laughs> well, I used to get a ton of emails about mentorship. Will you be my mentor? Will you do right. these things? And mentorship is legitimately a relationship. Mm -hmm. And to just go in and ask someone that, it's like asking someone in the first five minutes of them on a date if they want to sleep with you, right? It, it's just yeah. like, that's a lot. And most people are going to say no and completely balk at it. And so, you know, I, I think you're hundred percent right. It's like, Hey, um, at least give someone, give them some time one and yeah. some reasons why you might be a viable candidate that, that they again, won't balk from my, my, one of the biggest things I stress is to show rather than to tell. Yeah. on the resume, on any of these things, you want to show that you have certain capabilities and projects or having a toy or, or a web app is the epitome of, of showing, right? I, I would so much rather play around with a web app than go through someone's Jupyter notebook. That, that yeah. to me is, is like, let's see this in action. Uh, another thing that I, I would in, be interested in you guys A-B testing is I think you can embed GIFs in LinkedIn. And so oh, you just make a little GIF of your project of like, Hey, there's the difference between this and this, or, you know, it takes 15 seconds, but it's already embedded there. I can see that I can see the message. Um, that, that to me is like, okay, this is creative. They clearly know how to communicate their findings as well. So getting That's creative cool. with these things, if I see something that I have never seen before in a message, yeah, I, I'll, I mean, I respond to a lot of messages anyway, just because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I enjoy that for the most part, unless they're like really long, really big. But, uh, you know, those are things that uh, people don't really consider. Yeah. And, and I, I do think there's like a, a related notion too that we kind of have this implicit contract as, as human beings where 
if um, if I send you a message that clearly has required none of that none of my time was consumed in writing it, then like you're gonna go well, screw you. I'm not responding to this. Yes. And so people, I think, get into this mindset of like just spamming on on um, LinkedIn, playing this numbers game. What we've actually found is there's a disproportionate leverage in saying like, okay, I'm gonna investigate this person. I'm gonna do some real creeping. I'm gonna look up their company. I'm gonna look up what, you know, what their degree programs and find all the commonalities you alluded to like broadening your network and saying, oh, if they went to the same school, then they're part of your network. Well, there are a lot of other axes that that works along too. Like, did they, in my case, you know, were they a physicist before? Uh, did they have some startup experience and so on? Like, all these things are little threads you can tug on to make it clear that you're not just spamming a whole bunch of people. If they're, they're the special person to you and that's really important. Well, that's interesting is in theory, you can create a warm connection even if you don't know them, right? You can create this warm connection by doing your homework. So if someone reaches out to me and they say, hey, Ken, I've watched this video of yours, this video of yours, and this video of yours. I learned these things from it. Hopefully it wouldn't be that long of an email, but um, you know, they've done their homework on me enough to know how to ask an intelligent question. Yeah. And it, you know, a lot of people who are in this space have done projects. They have shared their work. They've done speaking engagements, whatever that might be. Asking a very specific question related to something that they've done can be a great way to start a conversation and, and that endears you to them because they, they realize that you've followed along with them, that you've invested your time in them in, in a certain way, whether it's watching a video, reading through a project, whatever that might be. So, you know, I, I would imagine that's probably one of the things your A-B testing um, turned up, especially in the gold stuff, but. Oh, um, absolutely. <laughs> it's actually, it falls into the broad category of what Ed, so my brother and my co-founder, refers to as uh, in sort of the cryptocurrency style as proof of work. So you actually have to show proof of work. You can do that in a number of different ways. Uh, you can do that by showing that you've stalked a person and not literally, but like uh, that you've looked up the company, that you formed opinions about it, that you have product ideas, that you, you have to do stuff that shows that you are not um, reaching out at scale. And um, because, because if you don't show proof of work, they're not going to do work Kind of to reciprocate that's the contractual the implicit contract between uh, between primates that we have every time we engage in those sorts of interactions and so i think like recognizing the humanity of the person you're reaching out to is is an under leveraged skill i think a lot of people um don't try to form a mental model like the amount of time that they expend trying to construct an accurate mental model of the person they're reaching out to is pretty limited and there's a lot of leverage there like you can really go far if you invest that time well, speaking of investing time in humanity, understanding people, you've, you have quite a successful podcast, again, that I was fortunate <laughs> enough to, to be on. And I would love to hear about your experience with that, how you got started, why you decided to go the storytelling route, which is obviously the route that, that I love as well. Yeah. Um, let, let's just start there and I'll, I'm sure I'll have a couple of follow-up questions. Yeah, I think it's a, it, it's a great question. So. One of the cardinal rules for me starting a startup, uh, sorry, sorry, starting a pro podcast, is that I wanted it to have independent value for me before any kind of like dependency on use uh, on uh, listener growth. So I knew that I just wouldn't keep doing it because let's face it, I mean you, you know this. I'm, I'm sure when you launched, like it was a long time where you just like you made videos and not many people were paying attention. But then eventually, like it took off, and then the channels that are really strong that produce great content like yours, like they they grow really fast, um, but it, it's a slog at first. And if you don't love what you're doing, if you're not getting genuine value out of doing it at the gate, you're not going to continue. And so the first really, the first version of it started off with me using it as an excuse to talk to people that I always wanted to talk to. So it was like, Hey, I've got this podcast and it's got the toward data science brand on it. And, and, you know, so, so come talk to me and it gradually evolved into this thing. Uh, we started getting people reaching out. I'm, I'm sure you've, you've had this now for years, but people started reaching out to us saying, hey, I, I want to be on, on your podcast. That was a big turning point. And um, yeah, so I think the, the first thing was I saw intrinsic value in it for, for myself personally to grow and learn and, uh, and the rest sort of followed after that. I absolutely love that. I think there's two huge other takeaways. So the first is that you can create opportunities for networking for yourself whether it's a podcast, whether it's yes. a blog, whether it's any of these things, 
that that is how you, you create these relationships that can lead to jobs or to other opportunities, whatever that might be. I'm a big believer in, I wouldn't necessarily call it the law of attraction, but you build enough of a brand, you build a reason for other people to communicate with you. And at a certain critical mass, the opportunities come to you rather than you having to go out to search for them. And I'm, I'm sure that that is very much the case at this point in your career. The other thing is that the, the idea of creating content for yourself. I think that if, if I look at the videos I've made, they're the videos I wish I would have had uh, when I was starting. But there's a whole nother angle to take is that if you document a process, you don't have to be an expert in something. If you document your process, one that's beautiful content, but you also have a log of how far you've come. That's one of the things that I'm really happy about with this 66 days of data thing that I've started is mm -hmm. that people can, can track their improvement over these 66 days. They can see all of the things they've learned if they look back at the tweets that they've written or any of these things. And we get really disappointed with our growth on a day-to-day -day basis. But if we look at our growth over a month or a year or two yeah. years, it is unbelievable how far we can come. So I think that the whole idea of creating something for yourself and, and leaving a legacy for yourself to look back on, it, it can serve multiple purposes. You, I mean, it can become a line of business. It can become something that thousands of people listen to or, or hundreds of thousands or millions of people yeah. listen to and, and create value for them. So I, I just, I, I love that whole concept and, and I cannot stress how important your, your, your um, your realization or recognition uh, or recognition of that is. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to, to ask you about the podcast or about having a voice is how important is it to have, uh, you know, some platform to, to speak or share your opinions in the data science community, whether it's related to a job or, or just in general? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think um, I, re I really like what you added there about the just all the different ways that you can create a brand for yourself, all the different ways that you can network yourself. There's so many different answers. Um, the space is so high dimensional that like very often we get stuck thinking along one particular mode. Like this is how people get hired in the space. So that's what I'm going to do. And the problem with that kind of thinking is you end up competing with everybody else. And uh, a wise man once said, competition is for losers. You really want to define um, a way of acting in the world such that you're not in direct competition with people. Um, so anyway, uh, with, the, was, with that, was that wise man, you or your brother? No, no that was, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Peter Thiel, but, <laughs> but yeah, so, um, I, I wish it was us though. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, in terms of the importance of a platform, uh, I think I'll, I'll sort of steal a thought from you. The first is the platform is different from the audience. And I think people get kind of confused between those two things. They'll post something out and then they'll allow themselves to be externally defined. If a lot of people don't like, don't clap, don't upvote my thing, then I'll let it get to me and like, I'm just gonna let this go. So no matter what you do in terms of platform, yes, you do need a platform. You do need to either write blog posts or uh, have your, your voice out there or, or videos out there. Uh, somehow to give people a sense. So the, the reason why that's so important, I'll, I'll just say to directly answer your question quickly is, um, you want people to feel like they know you when you walk into the job interview. A cold start happens on a lot of different levels. That you've got that initial cold start where you, you just like message someone in, on Tinder and say, hey, and the equivalent of doing that in data science is sending a cold email and being like, hey, uh, here's my project, I'm interested. Um, but then when you actually walk in the room the first time, if people are like, like Ken, if you go to, if you go to apply to a job pretty well anywhere. Um, they feel like, like they know oh, me already, yeah. Yeah. They right? heard me talk. They, Exactly. They even, they've even seen your facial expressions. They kind of know your demeanor and all that. Like, so I think video is, is pretty sweet and, and I suspect under leveraged even at this point. Um, but audio podcasts are nice too. You get the, the voice, but even just writing things out. The advantage there is you can put in figures, you can put in code, you can kind of interact the personality and the, uh, and the, the quantitative work together. I think one of the key things that people don't do enough when they write blog posts is insert their own personality. They feel like they need to enter this formal mode where they'll say things like, it, it's like how, um, how cops will speak when they're giving, when they're talking we about it. We reject, we reject the null hypothesis. In this exactly. Scenario. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it. You do the equivalent of like at a press conference saying like, 
uh, a white male suspect was apprehended and like like nobody wants to read that blog post man like so you know make it a little if you if you're a humorous person add some humor to it add some levity um figure out ways to kind of make that post reflect who you are and then when you walk in they already kind of know you it's a second date rather than the first date and all the other candidates are going to be on their first date by and large so that that already puts you far above everybody else i like that analogy quite a bit <laughs> uh, <laughs> Before I open things up to your anything you really want to talk about, uh, which is what I do for every guest at the end, is I, I want to point out just the the conversation. Oh my goodness, I lost my train of thought. Well, regardless, um, no, 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 okay, this is what it was. So the idea that you need to continue to create content even if the engagement isn't good or whatever that might be, you're creating this content for yourself because yes, you you like it because it's enjoyable. If, if you're at the whim of everyone else, you will not have any longevity in this space, right? I, I make videos because there are topics that I'm interested in, and I think that they'll be valuable to others. There, there's some balance there, but I, I would 100% burn out if I had to make all of the videos that that I thought everyone, you know, that people explicitly want. I mean, yeah. I, I like making tutorial content, but it takes forever for me to do. I would burn out if I had to produce tutorial content every week. I know that, and I'm trying to find a balance of producing that uh, that, that matches my, you know, my level of upkeep and and yeah. and stick to itiveness in the field. So I would I would kind of warn everyone that if you're thinking about data science too, you have to like data science. You have to like the problems that you're solving in data science to stick to it and to learn it. And the same with the job process, you have to figure out how to make applying for jobs enjoyable to you. If you're going to go the traditional route, you're going to be applying to hundreds of jobs to get the interview opportunities that you want. So you yeah. better figure out a way to make that process enjoyable or make it fun or make the companies interesting. I would always write just the weirdest cover letters. Um, oh, I like that. But because I wrote one, um, it was to, uh, it was for, a position I was not qualified for. It was like a, a like a super head of data science at, at a pretty large company re, re, uh, revolving around skiing. But I told a story of when I was a kid, the first time I went skiing at that mountain, that what it made me feel like, and and a lot of you know it's like a, an artistic piece more than a cover letter. Yeah. But 100% got to call the interview because you know if if they read it they'll be like this person loves skiing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very little about my background, but at, at the same time you have to make it fun for yourself in, in those different ways. So w without me droning on too much, I'd love for you to have the floor to talk about any final thoughts, any initiatives you have going on, really anything that you would like to discuss uh, relating to the podcast, anything else. Well, oh, I appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to think if, uh, what would be the most useful thing for me to say? You can I say guess... multiple things if you want. I mean, <laughs> I, I get more than a tweet. Um, cool, well, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to be succinct. I mean, I, I think, um, one of, maybe I'll go this route. So I think one of the most useful dichotomies that, um, that, that we can apply to our lives is the dichotomy between uh, deterministic and stochastic events. Deterministic events are things that you can control directly and explicitly. So I can control whether or not I pick up this cup. Um, stochastic events are things that you can't control. They're random, um, in, unpredictable. And I think one of the, the reasons that's such an important dichotomy to latch on to is, especially in data science, you will find as you apply for jobs that there are two components to those applications. One is a stochastic component. Will the company get back to you? You can't control that, totally out of your hands. And two is the decision to actually apply for jobs or the decision to learn a new skill or the decision to keep pushing in general. You can see how this generalizes to pretty much everything in life, of course, and that includes startups as well, but I'll be data science specific in this case. Um, so I think one of the biggest mistakes or categories of, of error that people can make in their lives is confusing one type of problem for another. So if you don't hear back from a bunch of companies that you've applied to, it's very common for people to start blaming themselves and enter a downward spiral. You have to learn not to take ownership for stochastic processes because that will kill you. You wouldn't you wouldn't blame yourself if you bought a lottery ticket and then you didn't win. So, to the to the extent that there are things out of your control, genuinely out of, out of your control, you you can't really blame yourself for those response numbers. But you can 
blame yourself for not applying or for not learning a new skill or for not polishing your reach out messages, for not doing any of the, the many, many things that you can't control. When in doubt, assume that you can control a thing and, and try to figure it out. Take a, a, an extreme ownership perspective, but um, watch that dance between the stochastic and deterministic elements in life because it's so easy to get caught up in one or the other. We tend to go, we tend to apply stochastic thinking to our mistakes and deterministic thinking to when we get things right. Um, so we love to take credit for the things we do right. We like to blame the randomness of the universe for when things don't go our way. Uh, I think the truth, depending on the personality, can be somewhere in between, but it's worth kind of making that explicit in your thinking and asking yourself, what part of this process, like map it out. If you're trying to do a thing, if you're trying to build a startup, for example, like map out all the things you have control over. You have control over what your team is. You have control over who you talk to. You can't control explicitly whether your product is going to work out the gate, but you can control how you iterate on it. And, and likewise in data science, when you're solving a problem, talking to your users, building code, or looking at the, the quantitative side of things, um, I think kind of being explicit about that, that distinction is, is a really important ingredient in, in data science and in life. I love that. That's something that has legitimately changed my life. Uh, you know, that, that, that concept. And I will also say that we talk a lot more about that concept in the podcast episode I did with you guys. So I'll definitely link that. Yes. Be sure to listen to that after you finish uh, tuning in to this video here. So thank you again for coming in. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And I'm well, sure quite a few people will be checking out the podcast because Frankly, your voice sounds a lot better than mine does on, on audio, whatever I, it might be. I so. had the exact opposite thought. <laughs> Maybe it's a podcaster thing. <laughs> oh, but again, thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next time that we, that we do something like this. Yeah, same here. Yeah, we're going to have to talk again soon.